Good afternoon and welcome. This is the third event in the Bell Hooks residency this spring. Some of you may have known that Bell Hooks did her first residency at the New School last fall to a stunning success in person and online. And we are live streaming this event, I believe. And so I'm Stephanie Browner. I'm the Dean of Eugene Lane College, the Liberal Arts College within the New School. And it's a pleasure to welcome you and our esteemed panel of talented, brilliant, visionary, radical thinking women. And I'm gonna make a few comments about each of them. So Marcy Blackman, on the end there, her first, woo! Marcy is a novelist. Her first novel, Poe Man's Child, received the American Library Association Stonewall Award for Best Fiction. Her second novel, Tradition, which came out June 2013 from Water Street Press, has been described as a novel to be savored and remembered. Her short fiction and poetry have appeared in many anthologies, including Black Like Us, Fetish, Beyond Definition, New Writing from Gay and Lesbian San Francisco, Signs of Life, Channel Surfing Through the 90s Culture, Revival Spoken Word from Lollapalooza 94, Brown Sugar, and her first nonfiction title, Bike New York City, The Cyclist Guide to New York City, was published in 2011. She is an avid cyclist and founding member of the Sister Spit Rambling Road Show. She once spent six weeks in a van with 11 queer poets on a cross-country spoken word tour. <laughs> and 12 weeks alone on a bicycle, pedaling from San Francisco to the Outer Banks of North Carolina. Marcy lives and writes in Brooklyn. Shala Lynch is on this end, and Shala Lynch is an award-winning filmmaker. Her feature documentary, Free Angela and All Political Prisoners, is a... <laughs> As many of you clearly know, is an account of the events, events that thrust Angela Davis into the national spotlight from a young college professor to a fugitive on the FBI's 10 most wanted list. The film premiered at Toronto International Film Festival in 2012, Code Black and Lionsgate distributed the critically acclaimed documentary in theaters last April. It's now available on DVD and digital download. Yeah. It won a 2014 NAACP Image Award for Excellence. Her first independent feature documentary was Chisholm 72, Unbought and Unbossed. <laughs> and as you can tell, this was about Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm's historic run for president in 1972. This film premiered at Sundance Film Festival and aired on PBS's POV series and garnered two Independent Spirit Award nominations and a prestigious Peabody Award for Excellence. Uh, Shala has worked as a visual researcher and associate producer for Ken Burns and Florentine Films. She worked on the two-part Frank Lloyd Wright documentary and the 10-part jazz series. She has since produced and contributed to works that have aired on BET, CNN, ESPN, HBO, Sports, PBS, and TV One. She holds a graduate degree in journalism from Columbia University and is working on a book uh, based on her new film. I think it's especially exciting that she's been named to be the curator for the Moving Image and Recorded Sound collection at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, one of the premier institutions in this city. We need Shala working on that collection backstage, she was saying. It's organizing and then growing that collection. And that is an important collection um, that we need to grow, deepen, expand, and make available to many, many scholars and filmmakers around the country and beyond. She lives in Harlem with her husband, Vince Morgan, and their two children, Julian and Violet. Janet Mock is, is a writer and an advocate author of Redefining Realness, My Path to Womanhood, Identity, Love, and So Much More, released by Atria Books and Simon and & Schuster. After publicly proclaiming her identity as a trans woman in 2011 profile in Marie Claire magazine, Janet focused her efforts on speaking about the struggles, triumphs, and portrayals of girls and women like herself. In 2012, she launched um, hashtag Girls Like Us, a movement that encourages trans women to live visibly. She currently writes and speaks about her experience of living at the intersection of identities. She's a board member of the Arcus Foundation, a global organization advancing social justice and conservation issues, and an advisor for young people, a young people-powered media site. She has also advised programming for trans youth at the Hetrick Martin Institute in New York. 
She's been featured in lots of uh, events and awards, uh, including an HBO documentary, and she's appeared on Comedy Central's The Colbert Report and MSNBC's Melissa Harris Perry, and her commentary has appeared on BuzzFeed, The Washington Post, Salon, Slate, Feminist, Feministing, NPR, Color Lines, and more. The Anti-Violence Project Add Color Awards and, Sil and the Sylvia Rivera Law Project have honored Janet for her work, and the honors go on and on. She's a native of Honolulu. She attended the University of Hawaii at Manoa and earned her MA in journalism from NYU and worked as a staff editor for People.com, the People Magazine website, for five years. She lives and writes in New York City with her boyfriend, photographer, and filmmaker, Aaron Treadwell. Finally, my pleasure to introduce Bell Hooks. <laughs> Esteemed visionary leader, radical thinker, poet, cultural critic, she inspires us and calls us to love and to decolonize our minds. In her writings on gender, race, teaching, contemporary culture, and other topics, she reminds us these are all topics that must be understood as interconnected through their ability to produce and perpetuate systems of oppression. She has written over 30 books. You have read many of them, I'm sure. Her most recent writing focuses on community, communion, loss, love, and the ability of loving communities to overcome race, class, and gender inequalities. She has published memoirs, poetry collections, children's books. She has taught many places, including Yale, the University of Southern California, Oberlin College, the City College of New York, and currently Berea College in Kentucky. She has joined us at the New School last fall, this spring, and again next fall, inviting all of us into conversations that push us and make us think more deeply, more honestly, more radically than we are often encouraged and inspired to do, both through tough questions and loving compassion and generosity. It's my pleasure to welcome Belle and all of our esteemed guests. Thank you very much. Welcome, welcome to all of you, all of you incredibly gorgeous uh, women out there who are liberating the female body and the black female body. Remember that Shahrazad Ali gave us um, the Black Man's Guide to the Black Woman? Well, she went on to do another book that, of course, received no attention hardly, which was Are You Still a Slave? Um, and I thought about that book a lot um, after seeing 12 Years a Slave because one of the aspects of the film I found so incredibly upsetting was the representation of the black female body, um, not just the bod body of Patsy, but the bod body of all the black women coded again as sexual servants, um, victims only there to satisfy the needs of someone else. And even the wife of Solomon, we never really see her have a voice. And a lot of people said, well, she didn't have a voice in the book. And I said, there wasn't that one black woman having sex in the book either. You know, the one that creeps over into the, to, to sleep with Solomon. I mean, think about that. He could create the sexualized black woman image. And people didn't question that image because isn't that what we are, black women? We'll just fuck on the minute. Anybody that, you know, and, and weep afterwards and it's like, we're all sitting there thinking, where did she come from? <laughs> what was the purpose of that scene? Uh, and yet, that was a fictive scene that he thought to put in. Why couldn't we have had those fictive uh, two 60 seconds where the wife said, mm, life was really hard for me while you were gone or something? I mean, it, it's, I just want you to think critically about what we do with the black female body why we image um, some things and not others. Why, if you can create that fictive sex scene, could we not have had any fictive moment in the film where the black female body is in resistance? Not in despair, because despair is not resistance. That is, you know, when Patsy thinks that about killing herself. 
Well, I, I mean, part of why I'm so excited and proud to be here today is that I am up here with black women who are all about redefining and creating a different kind of image, liberating the black female body. We were backstage uh, just talking about Shala's interpretation of Angela Davis and how, how it gave us a total different awareness of Angela Davis. And so that's what we hope to discuss and talk about together here, um, the negatives and the positives of redefining ourselves, getting outside the box. I said earlier, I had a conversation earlier that all my life I have wanted to be free. Um, and in order to claim that freedom, I had to resist my parents. I had to resist the imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy every step of the way. I, I was watching a TV show, if some of you know um, the astrophysicist, um, Mr. Tyson, and how he was asked, you know, was race um, a, a, a stopping block for him? And he said, are you kidding? Every step of the way, people were telling me I should be playing basketball, I should be um, doing anything else other than dreaming and becoming an astrophysicist, which was his dream early on in his life. So he said, like, people ask him, why aren't there more black men and women? Why aren't there more women of all colors, um, astrophysicists? And he makes that point that there are obstacles thrown in their way every step of the way. So that in a sense, claiming one's freedom, being free, there's always a price to be paid and a sacrifice. Um, so, I mean, I would like... Uh, Shala, since she's on our end here, to talk about herself uh, as how, how you begin to think about yourself as an image maker, how you begin to think about creating different kinds of images for black women. You had to have me go first. <laughs> well, I can always pass the buck to Janet. She's oh, oh, she threw it down like that? No, I got it. I got it. I got it. <laughs> So um, first, I'd like to say thank you. I am honored to be on this panel, and I'm looking forward to our spirited conversation. Um, so you know, you start by talking about what's inside the box and what's outside the box. The thing about it is, um, I don't know anybody who's inside the box. Um, so the inside the box for the, the, a black woman is not somebody I recognize in my family, in my history, in my culture in this room. <laughs> and so if you're going to be outside, you have to just accept it. <laughs> and I guess there are varying definitions of what that outside is. And so what do I mean, do, do, what do I mean exactly? Um, and you know, I went to the University of Texas um, from growing up in New York City. I went to run track. I wanted to be an Olympian. And I get there and people are like, well, you're not supposed to be in the honors program and you're definitely not supposed to be in the honors program and an athlete. What's that? Who are you? Where do you come from? Who are your parents? You, and, and I couldn't be black because that was outside their definition of blackness. So I had to learn how to say, well, no, you have to expand your definition. <laughs> and also, though, in terms of career, um, I never would have thought that I could be a filmmaker. I didn't know any filmmakers. Um, Spike Lee was doing his thing, and that wasn't, you know. And so I think that how I even come to what, I do, what I'm doing is having the experience of feeling outside and then looking for connectivity. And I looked um, to history because I didn't understand race and I didn't understand gender. I actually thought growing up in New York City in the 70s, Free to Be You and Me Baby <laughs> is my album, that you know Malcolm and Martin had taken care of the race thing and Gloria and the Gals, gender, on lock, and I could be an individual, right? <laughs> 70s in New York. Where did it go? <laughs> and that's not the case. So I looked at history, and um, I kind of rediscovered slavery and rediscovered the kind of repercussions of slavery, the ripple effects, the patina that we all deal with. And my answer was to um, reinvestigate, like an archaeologist, history and to refine my people, my line. And so that's how I can see Shirley Chisholm run for president and put her at the center of the story. 
not as the victim, not in the side character, not as a, that's how I can, you know, take a story, a political crime drama, and, and it's about a woman, a woman of color, Angela Davis. Um, and then the selling of it is a whole nother thing. So then I have conversations where somebody's like, oh, it's a great film as a documentary, but the only reason I would support it is I have to know who the main male characters are, because it needs, flipped to be a narrative, women's stories don't sell. So Angela is, um, it's a true story, but it's not, you know, her story is true, but not possible. People don't believe it, but it's all true. So. Well, I mean, it's interesting to think again about how, um, I, I asked audiences earlier today to imagine 12 years a slave without Patsy, because it's her whole sexualization, the s and cruelty that she endures uh, from white male and female, all of it is what gives a certain, quote, spice um, to, the, to the film. So it, it, it then leads us to question, do we have to have the black female dehumanized, tortured, raped, um, enslaved, in order to have our spice, our enjoyment? And I put this as a culture, because I, I, some of you may have remembered that I said at the Melissa Harris, about 12 years a slave, I was very flip and I said it was sentimental claptrap. Well, I got a lot of feedback uh, <laughs> from so many people who said they loved the film. And I guess I think all the time about, as a black woman, that when I see images of, like myself, abused, beaten, raped, tortured, I don't feel entertained. I don't feel like I can say, oh, I really like that, or I really learned from that. You know, I, as I've been saying to people, if I never see another naked, enslaved, raped black woman on screen as long as I live, I'll be happy. But, but it would have been different if it had been Patsy's story, if we'd yes. seen it from her point of view. Well, she had no point of view. That's right. the dehumanization. I mean, that's the, the interesting thing about the four fabulous ones up here is we all have point of view. Uh, <laughs> We all have told our stories in some way with our voices, not with somebody else. And so, we'll, we, in fact, Janet, especially, we can talk to us some about uncovering her voice and her story and having the courage to liberate her body from the containment of silence. Because that's usually what we as a culture have demanded of trans people, of gay people, of queer people be silent about it. Um, so tell us a little bit about breaking the silence. I can tell you, everybody up here was like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to wear because you know Janet <laughs> is going to be like <laughs> so glammed out. And I'm like, <laughs> and see, I wore pants for you guys today. So. Yeah, but you got those shoes on. I put on, on. lipstick for you. <laughs> and I wore this tie for you, and you got those shoes on. So, you know. <laughs> and we won't even talk about the fans. Glad we got that out of the way. Well, I'm loving that we're, that we're caring for each other this way and dressing for me. Thank you. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think I think a lot of my work is, as a as a writer, and probably just go back to just being a young person um, discovering mirrors, and as you said, going back to history to figure out who you are and what your perspective is. I know for me, I spent so much of my time, specifically in my middle school years in the library, seeking out books and images and words from women of color writers, specifically black women writers, um, who gave me life and possibility and imagination. Um, but I also had, on the flip side, I had women who were not able to have resources, black trans women, um, Asian trans women, in Hawaii who are not, did not have access to writing their stories down, did not have access to publishers, and who did not have that wealth of knowledge, I guess, um, credentialed in a way, but they gave me lived experience of what intersectionality is and what oppression is, and even, um, I guess, what, um, how cisgendered women look at trans women, how they view them as less than women, just as Tons of white women look at black women as less than women outside of what we say idealized womanhood is. And so for me, I tried to pull all of that into my own work with Redefining Realness and bring all of the composites of how I learned my image of self um, into 
this from literature, from those women I knew, um, and from popular culture and media as well. But say a little bit about th that whole courage of, of revealing and writing the book. And I was very concerned for Miss Janet and in terms of her family and other people, because people can be so cruel when you say something about them in a book. Well, people, well, yeah, well, that, I think that, I think anytime that you speak truths that are very uncomfortable truths and truths that you are told to be very silent about in order to survive, people don't like that sense of speaking up, and I'm sure you understand this in your own work. For me, I knew that the cruelty would be a part of it, but I also knew that the transcendence and the attachment and, like, connecting to you, I only connected to you through the fact of writing my book down and sharing it with you. Right, and so it also leads to that power of like resonance and mirroring where we see each other and each other's experiences from the point of naming yourself bell hooks and leading with your work and writing these things as a young woman when you wrote them, when there was no blueprint. I think that all of these things also lead to that as well. I, I think the naming yourself thing is really key and self-identifying and I think um, Everybody up here has named ourselves and, I sell and, and charted our own path through life against what we've been told we should be. And it's not an easy path, but it's also not so much of a choice. It's something that I feel like, at least for me, I, I have to do. I don't know any other way to live. Um, the Going back to the boxes thing, I don't see boxes. Um, and, you know... I only really ever hear people talk about boxes who are white, and generally white men, who say, oh, well, that was outside the box. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I'm like, what box are they seeing? <laughs> Clearly it wasn't a box that was meant for me, because I can't even find it. <laughs> you know, and, and so I think like, that that's really key to be able to we're doing something that cis white men have done ad infinitum, and that is we are defining who we are. And that's problematic for the world. And I think that's why there's, it's dangerous. And I think that's why it's because it's, it's problematic. It's, it, it's um, I had, an, I had an, an timely incident um, when I was flying back from Florida. I went on vacation. And I was flying back last week, and I got uh, through security, and security is always a, a, a tricky place for me in the airports, um, but because my ID and my boarding pass and the marker on my ID and my boarding pass always match, uh, you know, it, there's a lot of extra scrutiny. I'm often asked to repeat my name several times um, to make sure that the person standing in front of them is the person's name on the ID, my address sometimes. Um, it's, 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 a tricky, it's a tricky bit, but I generally get through and it's not, I don't have a problem. Well, this time, I, same thing, lots of scrutiny at the boarding pass um, ID checkpoint uh, slot. And then I went through and put my bags on the conveyor belt and I go through and I stand in the body scan. You know, I'm up there in the body scan and after I come out of the body scan, they ask me for my boarding pass again, which they're not supposed to do. And I give the man my boarding pass and he, waves over a female TSA agent who comes over and pulls me aside for a pat-down search, and I asked why. And they wouldn't say anything to me, and I said, look, I need to know why. And so the first response was, well, we always uh, search everybody three times. And I said, well, that's clearly not true. <laughs> because the 10 people before me just walked right on through and got their bags, right? You know, So why me? What's, what, what is it about me that made you stop? Did something go off in the scan? And finally she said, it's because we can't tell if you're male or female. Ma'am. <laughs> you know, so now, not only am I not in this box that I can't find and that I wouldn't want to get in anyway, but now I'm a criminal because I'm not walking or sitting or fitting or squeezing myself into this box that has def been defined for me by somebody else. I think that that, it just, those have been my most challenging experiences in relation to the idea of freedom and democracy because I am hassled so um, at the airport, taken into little rooms where it's the black woman who's touching my butt and all, all of these things while the white woman looks on and you feel like, you know, 
Of course, I feel like it's like, Bell, you're out of your place. Bell, you've been critical of the government. Bell, you've been this. And these things um, that affect the dailiness of your life do discourage you. And, you know, it, when, when it got to where they were going through my hair, like, what is possibly hidden up there in my hair? <laughs> but then you, you realize that it's just about making you have a hard time to be who you are, making you, and it's true, it worked. For a while, I just felt dreading of travel. Like, what is it going to be this time? And then, you know, travel has no humor, because I was traveling with Gloria Steinem, <laughs> and, you know, they were stopping me, and, I, and she was just floating on through, and I was like, look at that white woman over there. <laughs> she looks very much like a troublemaker <laughs> and somebody you should be stopping. Um, but, of course... You're not supposed to have any humor about any of this either because it's all supposed to demoralize you, um, to, to make you feel um, that you have no right to be here. And we know from all the, the, the young black females, the children we talked about yesterday who are bleaching their skin, who are committing suicide, who feel as that though there is no place um, for them. And so that that sense of making a place is what these women and myself are about. Like, what are the places we're making? Where do we find our greatest sense of freedom? So I thought that would be an interesting question. I asked her yesterday, well, is glamour a source of power? And I said yes. <laughs> I think I think I think even just leaving the home is a is a source of power. Even I think about every time when I go to the airport and they, they do the pat down of my hair every single time. It's to it's to make me not come out of my home, to not feel safe to leave my house. And I think I already internalized a lot of that stuff on my own. And so for me to pretty myself up in whatever way I want to to don a hot purple lip and to wear these heels and to walk out and to claim my body and to prettify it in the way that I want to prettify it. I think that there's, there's power in claiming that space. This little space that I have in this world is mine. And so I feel, especially in a world that tells me that I shouldn't exist, that I should remain silent, that I'm not attractive, that um, this little white woman's skinny body is what's the ideal, um, I think that I will. I will don all the glamour and all the glitter that I want. <laughs> um, and, but I will, I will do that for myself, not necessarily in the way that I was trained to do it, which, which was to do it in the pleasure or the gaze of a man. Um, and so that's the shift I think that has happened in my own life probably in the last seven years that I think just through my own experience of saying, who is this for? It's for me. She'll come to my house and be, I'll have Cocoa Puffs a la Buffy <laughs> and uh, Star Trek. And she'll say, well... I want to have those too, <laughs> and we will twirl our hair. And I think about that because in in my generation, where are the pictures? Yeah. Oh, we took selfies. We took okay, selfies. Great. Yes. <laughs> I want to see those. Well, it's funny because I feel a tweet we, coming on. You got to share. <laughs> we had an, another. Well, the way it got started, we were talking to Stephanie Troutman, our black woman friend, and she was saying we were saying our hair is in uh, cocoa puffs today, and she was like, "So is mine. Send me a picture." But I was thinking about that sense of playfulness because one one of the bell hooks work that really matters to me are the children's books because I feel like. Um, I wrote those books with much greater political intentionality uh, in the sense of wanting to say, how do we begin to free the black girl body, the black boy body, before they have undergone years and years of emotional assault and colonization? So I was talking yesterday in, about Happy to be Nappy and saying, you know, little girls telling me, you say our hair... Uh, feels like flower petals. Um, and, and to think again about how we image ourselves, the language that we use to talk about ourselves. Audrey and Rich repeats the line constantly, language is also a place of struggle. So that I think as black females seeking freedom, as women of color, we're constantly having to pay attention to language um, and to look at the language 
that we use for ourselves and the language that people use against us because a lot of times we are vulnerable to pushing that language. I wanted to apologize, Shala. I was looking for, uh, I, I, this is one of my sheroes, Lorraine Hansberry. Um, and I was rereading to be young, gifted, and black uh, because in it she talks about a, a, a particular moment in black female body history and she's talking about black women coming home from work, black domestics coming home from work. And she keeps using the phrase, you could be Jesus in drag, but they still think that you are selling. So that image of the black woman as prostitute, as I go around in hotels and, you know, white men are calling me on the phone saying sexual stuff, the men who stood behind me as I was checking in, I'm a, reminded of the fact that for so many years, black female bodies were not allowed in hotels because the assumption was that we could only be there for one reason, which is prostitution. So that thinking about the black, freeing the black body, I mean, I, I think part of our intellectual, academic, critical ex exercise is how do we free ourselves from those images to claim a different set of imaging. And I apologize, I was gonna buy it and bring it. The Time Magazine that has Beyonce on the cover because one could deconstruct for days that <laughs> first she's looking kind of like a deer in headlights and she's wearing the little panty and bra set, you know, that some of us wore like when we were 10 or 12. And I'm thinking, isn't this interesting that she's being supposedly held up as one of the most important people in our nation, in the world, and yet why did they image her? I mean, she's not glam on the cover of Time Magazine. Who, what is that cover meant to say about the black female body? <laughs> did other people see that cover and were you surprised? You know, there's a term that, um, that I discovered, I can't remember, in college or graduate school that is so relevant these days. Um, it's a feminist term um, for media studies, and it was called symbolic annihilation. And ooh, ooh. yes, symbolic annihilation. And it is two things. It, it, and it, it's Gay Tushman, who, Tuchman, or, who wrote about it. Somebody correct me if they know. Um, Hearth and Home. And it was a, a book, a compilation of essays about women, rep, women's representation in the media at, in the 70s, in the late 70s. Um, and symbolic annihilation is two things. It's one, not seeing yourself. But it's also seeing yourself only denigrated victimized, et cetera, and what that does to you. And I think that, you know, we can talk about all the things that denigrate us, but I'd rather shift the camera, shift my gaze, and look for right. the images and the people and the places that feed me. And I really do think, you know, you talked about children. Um, one of, I really do think that the more we create our culture, all our cultural images, the books you write, the films I make, the alternatives, um, that these are artifacts that live and they speak to people whether we're there or not. Bodies of work, and that is critical. So I want to just give one example. My daughter, she's four, right? I've been working on, she's never known me not working on the Angela Davis film, which took eight years, right? So she uh, was so excited when I, when I could show her the trailer. And my son was excited too, but she was particularly excited. The trailer's like two minutes long, and she watched that trailer over and over and over again. She had a favorite line when Angela said, it's genocide! <laughs> I was like, that's my girl! Right? She would point out all the characters. She loved going, that's Angela's mom. So she created Angela's family and a sense of community just by watching this thing over and over again. But that's not what I wanted to share. So she's a little girl. She wants to be a princess. I'm trying to convince her she wants to be a warrior princess, you know, but it's blonde and poofy and glam. Um, and w she woke up one morning, and her hair was all out, just like, you know, big, out, 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 out. And usually that's like, oh, mom, my hair is too puffy. You know, it needs to. And this morning, after watching the trailer over and over and over again, she said, I have Angela Davis. So 
I thought I was making this political crime drama with a love story at the center, da 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 da, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I was also making another image for young people to see and to perhaps relate to. And I was blown away. Because I can tell her she's beautiful all day long. I'm her mom, doesn't count. <laughs> but no, it doesn't, it doesn't. So the more we create the alter alternative universe, which then becomes the universe, yeah, I think that's really important. I mean, I, I don't write children's books, but I do in in my in my novels, uh, in my books, and my characters are the people who I grew up seeing every day who I don't see, not just in literature. I don't see them on TV. I don't see. I was raised by really strong women. I was raised by my great aunts and my grandmothers and my mother, and um, who, without fail to a person, allowed me to mark, chart my own path through the world and were there to support me in that and make sure that I didn't do anything to hurt other people or to, to that was adverse in that way, but they were there and they weren't there in the, in the worlds that I was inhabiting when I would sit, go to the library and read and they weren't there. So I decided I wanted to write them and I wanted to write people like me who I wasn't seeing in the books either. I wanted to, I wanted to create these characters and put them out there and I think what you say about self-representation and putting it out there to uh, count as a counter act against these other images, because not just, it's not just, a, like the Beyonce cover, it's not just about denigration, it's also about black women are supposed to be childlike and children. They, they need taken care of or bossed around or, and this is in the eyes of other people, you know? And so I feel like the little girl's clothing and the little girl's is, let's make this very powerful woman a little girl, you know? Um, I just saw the- A little girl we can lust, lust after. after. Yes. A well, little girl we can prey upon. A little girl that can be Woody Allen's daughter taken up into the attic um, and sexually abused with people witnessing on, from a distance but taking no action on her behalf. Because I feel like we have to draw those connections um, of our enslaved black female body to the enslaved black female bodies of all girls, all colors, um, with that predatory gaze. But it's interesting to think about, let's take the image of this super rich, uh, very powerful black female and let's use it in the service of imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy. because. Um, she probably had very little control over that cover, that image. I think image. she had control over what she wore. I know that she hires the stylist who's been with her for a long time. They've developed probably that look for that specific cover. I think she, mm. and I, I so would argue, I would collude. argue that, I, I would mm. argue that she has, she has the power now, like having worked in magazines, that she has final cut approval, um, and she chose this image. And so I don't want to strip Beyonce of that agency of choosing this image, of being her own manager, of all but of this stuff. But then you're saying then, though, from my deconstructive point of view, that she's colluding in the construction of herself as a slave. Are you well, still yes. a slave? Or, she, it's not a liberatory image. Or she's, she's, she's using the... Ima same images that were used against her and us for so many years, and she's taking control over in that saying, if y'all are gonna make money off of it, so am I. But you know? so and, and, and there is, a, there's, there's collusion perhaps, but there's also a bit of reclaiming, I think, if she's the one in control, right? Well, of course, I think that's fantasy. I think it's fantasy <laughs> that we can recoup the violating image and use it, I mean, is, you know, like I used to get so tired of people quoting Audrey, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. But that was exactly what she meant, that you are not going to destroy this imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy by creating your own version of it. Um, even if it serves you to make lots and lots of money. Uh, because uh, i I really been challenging people to think about would we be at all interested in Beyonce if she wasn't so rich? Because I don't think you can separate her class power and the wealth from people's fascination with her, that here is a young black woman who is so incredibly wealthy. 
And wealthy is what so many young people fantasize, dream about, sexualize, eroticize. Um, and one could argue even more than her body. It's what that body stands for, um, the body of desire, fulfilled, that is wealth, fame, celebrity, all the things that so many people in our culture are lusting for, wanting. I mean, if, let's say, if Beyonce was a homeless woman who looked the same way or a poor down and out woman who looked the same way, would people be enchanted by her? Or is it the combination of all of those things that, that are at the heart of imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy? And I've been saying, people of color, we are so invested in white supremacy, it, it's, it's tragic. Lorraine Hansberry says that it is the only form of extremism that should discredit us in the eyes of our children, that we remain so invested. Because I, I think it goes back to, and Shala first brought this up, the, the, the thing about, I say to, to my students, to other people, decolonize. But there's also that price for decolonization. You're not going to have the wealth. You're not going to be getting your genius award uh, funded by the militaristic imperialist uh, MacArthur people. Or, and I'm not saying anything negative about the people who receive those awards, but there is a price that comes with decentering, decolonizing. Um, and part of what has to happen for us to be free is we have to create our own standards of how to live. I mean, and you, as Miss uh, Cyclist, uh, awesome cyclist, I mean, what, and she's not saying, she also works as a, an accountant, a CPA, is that? No, I'm not a CPA, but I do prepare taxes. <laughs> How come I always get your identities confused? Because there's so many. <laughs> but the thing is, it's like she does a lot of creative things to pay the bills, to bring the money home. And they're not all exciting. Um, Texas is pretty exciting. <laughs> I'd like to do your taxes sometime. The experience of my life in Texas <laughs> is dread. Um, but I'm just saying that I want us to stay with that whole, the cost of liberation. Because we know that people don't want to be oppressed. But a lot of times we will remain enslaved because it's just simply easier. It's simply more well paid. I mean, I think about Janet here. I mean, Janet wants, in her, her dream is a dream of being a writer. And part of that fulfillment of that dream has been writing about her experience um, as a trans woman. But it's not, that is not the theme that she wants for her life. Like everything I write, everything I think has to come out of that persona. That was like one aspect of her imagination, her mind, her experience. I think when, you know, when Sweet Honey and the Rock say, when we work for freedom, we cannot rest, the real challenge for her as she gains greater and greater power of self is to be able to move both inside that identity and outside it as you so choose. The question will be is whether this marketing apparatus that is our commodity culture will affirm you in any way as you try to move outside um, the boundaries that have been set. We're really into trans right now, people will tell me. Oh, yeah. You know, it's like the, the ordinary people. Um, it's almost like they flip the hate channel, and it turns onto the, the voyeur channel. And the, uh, isn't it interesting? Isn't it cute? Isn't it fascinating um, channel? But, uh, but nothing is really changing there that is opening up, that is saying we want to hear from Janet Mock talking about many aspects of culture. Can you jump into that? Yeah, I think I do it by just speaking about what I want to speak about. And I think it's the challenging of what Marcy said earlier, these boxes. I think a lot of my media frustrations and biggest upheavals and brouhaha's have been about challenging white, white, cis, heterosexual, rich men about how they think my life should be distilled in order to suit their audiences. 
And there's and so much more in my book subtitle for a reason. It's not just about this idea of me seeking um, reconciliation with my body and gender and society's expectations of what my gender is supposed to be, but it's also about a story about a girl growing up in Oakland at the height of the crack epidemic with a father who's struggling with that and a mother and father who were super messy and had so much struggles of their own that framed how I came into this world and thought of self and my father's gender policing of me and my grand, my maternal grandmother and aunts who fed me so much images of black womanhood beyond just Claire Huxtable that was so you know, visible and like aspirational for me, which was the connection to wealth that I was growing up with. It was like, oh my God, I want a brownstone in Brooklyn. That's what I want. You know, I still kind of want that, but it's, I know. Who doesn't want that? But it's, you know, and I, I think about going back to your daughter and talking about um, seeing Angela Davis and her claiming her hair and the space that it takes up. And I think about at the height of the 90s pop boom, just bear with me, this is, I'm, <laughs> This is my age. I watch TRL all the time, and seeing Destiny's Child for the first time on TRL in a space where it was only in sync and Britney Spears and Christina Aguilera and everyone was blonde and choreographed and everything, and to see them come in as this, as I guess my generation Supremes for black girls spoke to me on so many levels to have that representation as a 15 year old to see. And so I, have, I think I have a different relationship with Beyonce because we're a year and a half apart specifically. Um, <laughs> and it's not that I don't see her without critique, because I do. I see so many things that bother me about, you know, like the drunken love lyric. Why does she let her husband say that about anime? You know, all of this stuff. I, I wish that that was not in there. But also having Partition come out um, in December, like a couple months before my book came out, when I'm writing about sex work and sexual abuse and issues with my body and my sexuality, it was freeing to have Beyonce and showing her ass and owning her body and claiming that space, that meant a lot to me because it gave me the okay as someone who I looked up to since I was 15 to have that. And I'm not saying that she is not participating in all of this, but I do think that there is power in her leaving her father. And I don't think that she's going straight into Jay-Z's hands, but that documentary was about leaving her father and saying, I will not let you give this distilled image of me anymore. And I, that resonates with me on so many levels too. And so we can continue to critique, but that was my... <laughs> My concern, though, is that whole idea, again, when we think about containment, that we say, oh, but this person who is doing um, major harm, let's say, because I, I see a part of Beyonce that is, in fact, anti-feminist, um, that is assaulting, that is a terrorist, um, in the sense of... Um, especially in terms of the impact on young girls. Um, the, I mean, I actually feel like the major assault on feminism in our society has come from visual media and from television and videos. I mean, just think, where would, do, in, do we even know of late any powerful man of any color who's come out with some tirade against feminism? The tirades against feminism occur so much in the image-making business, in what we see. I mean, think about um, Snow White and the Huntsman, if you saw that. The, the image of Shirley's, um, his character as the, the wicked stepmother, but the interesting thing that we see in that film that I didn't see any reviewer talking about is that character talks about her mother releasing her as a child into the hands of adult predators. Um, and, and her amazing line in that film, where she's looking a little like a hot, glorious dynam, is she says, men ruin women. And it's this whole sort of anguish of having to be in this world as the sex symbol, as the sexual, whatever. So I guess what I, I'm concerned about constantly in my critical imagination is why is it that we don't have liberatory images that are away from, um, not an inversion of what society has told us, but that our, our own sense of what am, I, what am I looking like when I am free? Um, I can tell you this, I ain't wearing no t-shirt when I'm free. 
I'm wearing this T-shirt, um, which I, Stephanie, my friend on the front row here, was like, I don't wear T-shirts, but this T-shirt was made by the women's studies folks, Carlin and Anna at St. Norbert's College in De Pere, Wisconsin. And they made this as part of their year of bell hooks celebrating my work. Um, and they wanted me to wear it here in New York City so that people would have that sense of an intersectionality, that it's not just New Yorkers that are reading bell hooks, but there are people in St. Pierre, Wisconsin. <laughs> but my point is, um, this is not liberatory for me. <laughs> I have, um, because I'm it's not- It's mandatory. <laughs> exactly. And, I, I liked it that uh, Stephanie was saying, well, now it can be a sleep shirt. Uh, I like the idea of sleeping with bell hooks. See, that's a different um, kind of, e even that becomes a different kind of imagining of eroticism. What is my eroticism in relation to myself? Um, I liked it when Janet was saying, how do, how do I change my relationship to glamour so that it is about myself? about, uh, like me, I work at home mostly. What do I wear? What do I see when I look in the mirror? And it's easy to get really lazy uh, when you work at home. Like, my sister was like, oh, haven't you been wearing that T-shirt for the last four days? And I'll be like, yes. <laughs> yes, I have. <laughs> because well, I noticed that when I'm stressed, um, I often will cling to something that I'm wearing as like my little comfort zone of the moment in time. But again, I think about those images that we are creating within our own private spaces that have to do with independence, power that are completely counter hegemonic, not a, a, like um, conceding to what is. I mean, part of why I wanted to talk with Lisa tomorrow of 20 Feet from Stardom is that she struck me as the one female in that film who, was, who grew into the power of her body, the plump black female body, the natural hair, the short hair, that all of that long hair, starving yourself, drugging yourself, whatever you had to do to be like the, the in girl, um, goes away for her as she begins to embrace her life and claim herself. So that I wanted us to talk about that because it isn't the same as if she had continued to try to be thin, try to have the straight hair, and made millions. Um, that is not the image um, that would, for me, be exciting. What, what's the image that's exciting for me is, is the sense of her power that comes through. Um, that she's making certain choices. What are you thinking? <laughs> I, I'm thinking that, you, you know, I, I'm, glamour for me is maybe something a little different than what people think glamour is for them or Janet thinks it's for her. But for me, I, I, I think I'm extremely glamorous and, <laughs> and yes. I think I look good. Well, I think you're glamorous and look good <laughs> too. Thanks, Bill. And, and I, and, I, and I think, and in fact, the TSA the thing, socks. In the socks, thank you. I'm glad you noticed that, Charlotte. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and with the TSA uh, woman, you know, I, I, I joked to um, some friends over the weekend that I was just like, you know, I'm just going to take it as she was attracted to me. <laughs> and she was bothered because she couldn't figure out if she should be or not. <laughs> you know, and that bothered her. And I think I bother people when I move through the world, and I like that. I don't want you to be comfortable. One thing I, I was thinking. I, I, I actually, I okay. want to say something. I have a friend who is a very successful entrepreneur, and she's, in a, it's, she's a black woman, young, and has made millions with, in the technology field. And she says to me, Shala, sit on your side of the table. And what she means by that is exactly what you're saying you know what, you're allowed to say, claim your reality. She was attracted to me, I bother her. Well, that's just the way I roll. And to not worry about it as a negative. Like we have to be, be able yes. to, 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 to claim our positivity and to create our world. I mean, that's not to lie, I don't think. But I, I do feel like it is, that's part of 
being able to do the work is you can't worry about everybody else and you can't you have to sit on your side of the table and i think that's a really important thing it is really important and i think it's it's more so much more important too that we sit up here and we talk about this for the girls that you speak of, speak of though the little girls and say claim yourself you know, whoever that self is that you want want to be. If that self wants to wear all different kinds of things of many colors at once, then wear all different kinds of things of many colors at once and, and, and bounce down the street because you know you look good, you know? Like, claim it and, and, and claim it even if you're the people who are supposed to be supporting you in that don't. But, but let's go back to Shala saying, even though she could say those words to her four-year-old, those words were not going to have a transformative impact coming from her. And I, I thought what really struck me when you were telling that story was, one, the incredible power of images. The, I mean, that there, that image changes something. Uh, little girls read Happy to be Nappy, and it changes something. So for me, I, I have to know that we have to be about that work of creating the counter hegemonic image in order for that transformation to take place. Oh, a com a completely. And I, I love the idea of creating a cultural artifact so that we think that the most important thing is we create it and it's a big smash now. That's like saying you're only kind of important in your 20s and you can't be, you know, fabulous after that. That you create something and you never know when it's going to have its pop. It happens to artists all the time. So I do believe that the work of a place like the Schomburg archives, collections are incredibly important because it houses the evidence. And somebody's going to come along and see something that wasn't seen before or discover, discover a, a manuscript that wasn't published. But Right, so a manuscript that wasn't published, but then it has its moment, and maybe it'll be published 50 years from now and impact the world. But creating the cultural artifacts, whether other people are paying attention or not, I think is critical. And yet we have to deal with how do we encourage people to do that if their mind is on making money or making fame or making celebrity. Um, I used to believe that by the time I reached the age of 40, 50, that there would be so many people, young black females and males who would have surpassed Bell Hooks, that would be like, wow, you know, Bell used to be useful, but, we, <laughs> but we've gotten so much more um, visionary theory. And yet, that hasn't happened. And so those things concern me, and I think one of the reasons it hasn't happened is, as I was saying earlier, uh, yesterday that when I went to see Beast of the Southern Wild and it so upset me the imaging of the little black girl and I came home and I wrote that piece and I was crying as I was writing that piece um, there wasn't any sense on my part the hours that I spent I'm not gonna m make any money I don't even know who's gonna read this and so once again, it's my, because I want to think us to think about cooperation and collaboration, because it's my friend and colleague Stephanie who said, well, you should put this, um, I should, you should let me put this on the internet, um, which she did, and people read it, but there was no monetary reward for me. More than anything I've written, I got so much hate back about how screwed up I was, how crazy I was. I couldn't see how beautiful the film was. Um, and so that one has to think about doing work, creating work that may or may not have reward. Um, financial reward. Financial There's reward, There's so many yes. more rewards. This but is so, but true. you've got to embrace that. But I, I do think, so the, one of the things you write about is self-care and learning to care for yourself. But I do think that if this is work you want to do, you do have to find a way to make sure you can pay your rent and eat. And so, you know, you may work at an archive, right? But it's an archive that thinks like you do. It's, it, it's, it's in the same vein. You may be a CPA or, Not you know, CPA. do a taxes. <laughs> <laughs> or teach or, you know, et cetera, that I think that that is, there's something that Angela Davis says in the end of the film um, where she says the politics, you know, the advocating, this is the way we live our lives. 
This is the way, it wasn't something we did uh, for a moment, but this is the way we live our lives. And if you look at her life, she has been an activist and maintained that idea. Um, and so I like that. How do we live our lives? How do we integrate the work, the politics into our lives and still eat, have a glass of wine? You know. Well, I, I mean, and I think that one of the ways that we do that is by creating within ourselves alternative systems of valuation. Um, you know, like uh, when I went away to college and I was told, well, you, you did someone write this paper for you or um, can you write? Um, you seem to have problems writing. And I'd never had that image of myself before, having gone to segregated black high schools where I was encouraged to write and, and to feel good about myself as a writer and a thinker. But then I go into Stanford University and just the opposite begins to happen to me. And you begin to, it's almost like you can experience yourself crumbling or disintegrating, uh, the, the, the doubt coming in. So what keeps you strong? What keeps you uh, going on? And, and the irony for me is it, one might say I wrote myself into freedom. When I sat into the, in those women studies classes um, at Stanford and Tilly Olson's class, to be specific, and heard those white girls say that, you know, we've never worked. We've never worked. I kept thinking, well, what women are they talking about that have never worked? And it was there that those seeds of ain't I a woman, black women in feminism began to take root uh, in my 19-year-old self because I was looking into a mirror and not being able to find that image looking back that I could feel like, yes, this is where I come from, this is who I am. And so that was, that was the beginning of, of I must create this world for myself. I must create the understanding for myself of where I'm coming from of what I've experienced, of what I know, which is that black women have always been workers, worked long and hard, but work has not been liberating mm -hmm. for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, and what does it mean for us to think about doing work that liberates? I, I just want to jump in here. Um, there was, you mentioned archiving, and I always thought about my worst case scenario, If I even if I make no money with this book and no one reads it, at least if I get it published or written down somewhere, um, some black girl from the future will find it we'll and have it reclaim at the shop it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll reclaim it and then do what Alice Walker did for Zora Neale Hurston in Their Eyes Were Watching God, which was the seminal piece that kind of shifted me in terms of literature and writing and thinking that I could write my own possibilities and proclaim my identity and say that the quest for self and the quest for writing self and the quest for revealing self is something worthy and leads to liberation. And so I always think that was always my worst case scenario. So I'm happy that I'm not there, but um, I always think that it never, that's what encouraged me to continue to write. So that up here are four fabulous women for whom the, the journey to freedom has also been so much about the journey of imagination. The, the capacity to imagine yourself differently, counter-hegemonically. And that's why the imagination is so important. Um, because there, because Sh Shala imagined Angela Davis in a different way from the, the images we had of her. Um, that imagination of oneself is, I, I would like us to end on that note and people can speak about creativity because it is striking to me, and I didn't think of this when we were first putting the panel together, that for each of us, creativity um, and the uses of the imagination have been what led us into the freedom that we have. Um, it is what enhances my life every day um, to be able to think and create and leap um, and jump beyond where, uh, I feel like we've been told theoretically, intellectually, that we, we should go. Um, so if you will say your final thoughts on that, we'll open it up and talk okay. with the audience. Um, I have historical imagination. 
I look back and I am in search and I love finding um, our acts. I think of, you know, I want to see verbs. So Shirley Chisholm runs for president, you know, Angela Davis, political crime drama. Um, I'm always asked, what's your next project? And I am working my, well, I'm not even working my historical imagination. I'm just shifting the lens a little bit. And my next project is a scripted narrative feature movie project. And it is about a woman who lived before the Civil War, who self-liberated herself. She self-liberated herself. <laughs> Redundant, but she did. She left her free husband and her family behind and went to the North. She got there and she was like, this is great, but it's kind of lonely. I want to go back and bring more people. <laughs> so she did. She went back dozen, uh, hundreds of times, saved hundreds of people. And she is an action heroine, yet we don't see her that way. Her name is Harriet Tubman. Do you know what her tagline was? Live free or die trying. So my story is Harriet, live free or die trying, an action story. <laughs> now, how did we not see her genius? How did we, better than 007, we don't have to make it up. This happened. It's written about. There's historical record. <laughs> So we, I call it historical imagination, but really it's just like looking back and reclaiming it. <laughs> and, and so if you had a choice between that image and a patsy, because I kept saying that I would never want my girl what choice? child to see 12 years a slave because it's the imprinting of the sense of black female body as victimized, yes. or that image of the black female body that says, I'm going to find a way out of no way. Sojourner saying, when I cried out in a mother's grief, none but Jesus heard. Yes. But she made her way. And her weapon was to use our low expectations of her as her status as a black woman a slave. She used it as a weapon to disguise herself, to get into spaces, to maneuver it with invisibility. I mean, literally, she cloaked herself in invisibility. She, that's an action heroine. That's better than Harry Potter. <laughs> At least say some final words. Okay, I just met uh, <laughs> Janet uh, a few months ago, and I didn't realize I was being teamed up with her. And I was like, well, who is this Janet? And I'm sitting in the hotel lobby, That's what I was thinking. And Janet comes in, and right away, we just feel that click, that resonance of like-minded souls. And I want to say that because I think that, that we are not alone and that the process of healing, all of that does not take place in isolation, that it helps. Um, as Janet was beginning a journey, her journey on the circuit, that journey that I took many, many years ago, we could talk about it together. And I could you know, say to her, well, beware of this particular pitfall. So that I wanna say that that heroic journey to freedom is not a journey that we make by ourselves, we make it by selectively choosing the people who strengthen us, who empower us, and who make it possible for us to keep on going. Who see us. Yes. Well, I think my, my journey comes, the creativity comes from um, telling myself that I deserve to be in the same space as Bell Hooks, that I deserve her company and her wisdom, right? And I think that so much, so much of, I, was, I called her a living um, legend last night, and she got upset. She's like, what do you mean legend? <laughs> people, people are treating me I like stars. I'm not a star. I was like, well, to us, you're everything. Like, I read you when I was in um, freshman year of high school, feminism for everybody. I mean, like, it's, it was there and available. You know, we also read it in Hawaii as well as Wisconsin. But... Um, <laughs> But I think the imaginings is like saying that myself, myself is this big and I deserve to take up this much space. And so I deserve to have my book written. I deserve to write down my story. I deserve to be heard. I deserve to, to be here and to be present and um, to challenge things that um, many people, the fact that, like challenge people who don't want me to exist, who don't want to see me then don't see me, get out of the room. I'm not moving though. And that's how I've kind of left my, lived my life, like ever since I was 13 years old. And so that's how I find my creativity. Yeah, I, I, I have to keep writing um, because the stories that I want to read still aren't being told. 
And uh, so I, I have to keep writing them. And in those stories, someone asked me once, because I write fiction primarily, um, and I don't write memoir, and I, I don't write autobiographical. But if I'm honest, then every book that I write is autobiographical in that every character that I create is a part of me and imagining myself in a world where these real three-dimensional people live and they're not these caricatures or cartoonish people that are created in the other literature that I have to read. And so um, that's, that's where I am and that's where the next projects are. Thank you. Goodly amount of time for Q and A. Uh, I always say, with Buddhist compassion, if you're going on too long, I will ask you to stop. Um, but who has a first question for us? Say your name. Uh, let us know what you're thinking. Your name? Uh, my name's Bianca London Potts, and I currently go to the New School. Um, I'm currently studying for my MFA in creative writing, and I pretend that I write fiction. Um, my question is currently focused on, I don't know if you saw it, but there was an article in the New York Times written by Juno Diaz, um, amazing author, definitely has his cred, and there was just like a clusterfuck of horrible comments in response to the article. It was dealing with the experience of being a person of color in the MFA, and what you have to do to navigate that space in the classroom, the academic creative space, in battling the, the myth of the white default, the white male, white straight male default that silences so many writers. So I'm headed into my second year, it's a two year program here at the sure, New School, sure. and I was wondering if you had any sort of like comments or suggestions for writers who are trying to write the self in a space that oftentimes just because of the way that the program's structured or the time limits or even the students or the, or the professors doesn't have the time to address the systemic issues that are going on in workshop and how that can be violent for the writer or the black female writer. Well, the first thing I would say is stop saying that you're pretending to be a writer and call yourself a writer. Um, is the first thing I would say to that. Um, and then secondly, I think, um, I read that article uh, that by Juno Diaz, and he's one of my favorite writers as well. Um, I went a slightly different route. I mean, I didn't get an, an MFA for that reason. I didn't go into creative writing. I decided to um, get a literature degree because I felt that reading was m more important than someone trying to tell me that what I wrote wasn't valid or trying to tell me that my voice didn't exist yet. Um, I knew I had a voice and I knew that what I was writing was valid. Um, and so in terms of how you navigate that space, um, I think we have to go a little bit above and beyond, unfortunately. I think, you know, I think we, there's a bit of resistance work that needs to be done where, you know, keep writing and keep believing in yourself as a writer. And if you have to go outside to other workshops with people of color and have groups where you are validating each other, because there are people of color in other schools in New York City who are having the same issue and the same experience. And so find each other and support each other and validate each other so that you're armed when you go into the classroom. Thank you. Hi, my name is Luz Schreiber, and um, I, um, I, first I want to thank you. This was really touching and moving and inspiring. Um, I'm currently writing a play um, with a co-writer and dancer in Mexico, in Zapotec, um, from Mexico, and also um, my heritage is also Jewish, so I have those two elements. Um, and I just, I feel very conflicted about um, your comment about 12 Years of Slave, and I'm very nervous to push back um, on your comment because I felt, um, I recently wrote like a 24, I was in Mexico for the winter, and I wrote like a, this 24-hour production. They said, write something for International Women's Day about gender violence, and I said, oh, I, it was a drag. But I did it, and first I said, no, I want something empowering, but then I realized that 
at least you know where I'm from, we still need to have those conversations about rape and violence on stage. It's so it's um, for the first time where I'm you know people don't do theater so much, and to see that on stage and to be able to be able in community and have a space for conversation was really important for people. And now we're expanding on that, and I don't want to write anymore from place of victimhood, but I think. What I'm struggling with is how can we have those conversations, um, recognize that, you know, like the, you know, the role of slavery, of um, colonization on women's bodies. How can I have a conversation with my mom, with my grandma, who was raped in the Mexican Revolution, you know, and, and still imagine, still make space for my daughter and all our daughters and our granddaughters. So, you know, can we make space for both? we have been so saturated. I mean, I think one of the big lies that's going around is, oh, we never talked about slavery. Oh, we don't have images of slavery. I mean, we, got, we had roots and more roots, and there have been all these different books and productions, so that I think of that as a kind of myth-building thing when people say, oh, we don't have images. Um, and I guess what I, I wouldn't say that... It, Notice I didn't say I don't ever want to see anything about slavery. I'm saying that I don't want to see those same tropes over and over again. Um, I was telling people recently that I was reading a book that was talking about the Quakers um, and the point at which John Woolman and the Quakers met to decide would they continue to support slavery. And they decided that they could not be the believers in the God that they said that they believed in and support slavery and more importantly, that they should pay some back wages um, to those slaves. That, that would be an interesting film for me, because I said, when I read that, I thought, this embodies something we were talking about earlier today, which is the power of white people to change, of racist white people to change, of terrorists to change. Um, and that is finally more interesting to me as an image, as an idea, than the, the Rep repetitive image of victimhood. And I think that there are all kinds of images and stories out there um, that could, could, could bring us into a different level of understanding. Your name? My name is Ebony Murphy Root. I'm a middle school humanities teacher at a progressive school on the Upper West Side. And I've been following since Saturday night um, the fallout from Leslie Jones's joke on SNL. Um, I don't know if anybody else saw that. Um, but her joke was basically that um, if it were still slavery time, she would do a lot better with men because she would be a breeder. And um, there she was would be a what? A, if she'd be a breeder. She, would, she oh, called okay. herself, I think, like she would be a, a mandingo. She's six feet tall. She would, you know, birth powerful children. And so there was a reaction today uh, by Brittany Cooper in Salon. There was a reaction by Jamila Lemieux in Ebony. And then there was a, a different sort of reaction taking the opposite side of uh, Patrick Phillips on the intersection of ma uh, madness and reality. But my question is, where are we as a culture when black female bodies are still used as the vehicle for humor? And she's, you know, she's a black woman. She's one of the two new black women writers added to SNL. And her reaction to, to the fallout, to the backlash was that this is a joke. You don't get it. Um, I'm, I'm pointing out that this is about the valuation and desirability of black women. And I don't know, I don't know how to feel about that. I've sort of been going back and forth. And to me, it's just, it's so raw for her to say that. But I wouldn't say that always humor has to be contextualized. That something in the wrong context, you know, I mean, we, we used to talk about this around the word bitch. Um, that my best girlfriend, if she hasn't called me for days, I might call her and say, bitch, your hand broke. What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> but it, 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 That's dial-up? <laughs> <laughs> like, your hand <laughs> broke. <laughs> but us using, turning that language into a speech that is about our bond and what we allow for one another wouldn't be the same um, as somebody outside that circle of respect using that language to slam me, um, to devalue me, so that I think that, again, think about context, and I think comedians have to think about context um, when you make certain kinds of jokes. Um, and it's harder, because we know that it's been so much easier to make the anti-gay, the anti, 
uh, black woman I talked earlier about, isn't it interesting that Tyler Perry, you know, epitomized like producing a certain kind of hatred of the black, older black woman, the middle aged and elder black woman where she becomes like the clown, the buffoon. Um, and I was talking about how in our segregated worlds of the past, black women elders were so crucial, um, you know, to who we were and to who we were gonna become and talking with them and how Tyler Perry alone in his image making has done so much um, to defame that image, to make that image be hateful. Or, you know, Madur, Madir is you laugh at Madir, but she's also embodies a certain kind of people have a hatred of the Madirs. They're seen as the police people, the enforcers, um, in ways that um, are not liberating at all. And, and let's go back, black people. Black people love those images when the P Tyler Perry movie is coming out. And I get tired of people saying, but we, that's how we see ourselves, we see ourselves. It's like, you know what, everything about ourselves um, is not so great that we don't need to drop it or change <laughs> it. Um, and that I think is, is the hard thing, to think about what other kinds of image. Uh, when did you last see some amazing love story that involved a, a, an elder black woman or a middle-aged black woman. Um, it, just think about the images of ourselves that we have just never seen in a film. In a, go ahead. I, you know, in the Free Angela story, there's a love story at the center of it. And uh, we do these recreations, a meeting between Angela and her lover at that time. And the FBI is there. It's this very tender moment where they get to meet and the FBI is watching, or the, the, the prison guards are watching, and they interpret it as something so ugly. Uh, it's in the FBI files as um, pornographic, as wrong, as all of this. But I felt it, and I was actually criticized by some bloggers for having made up that scene as though it didn't exist, because it wasn't possible for this person who was, who was blogging about the film for Angela to be a political activist and also have love. And I mean, but that's, but that's deep, the, like the idea that we are not lovable and that there is no evidence of that and that if it's in something and it's tender, it's either interpreted as really pornographic or you made it up. I mean, woo. Your name? Hi, my name is Erica Jones and I teach at a private school in the Upper East Side. I teach high school history. And um, one of the questions I had actually dates back to when you were here in the fall with Eve Ensler. And one of the um, comments that you made that's really stuck with me is, how do we live in a world that's not ready for us? And it's something that you all have commented on tonight with regard to really working hard to create a space for ourselves. And I think for me, as a black woman who's a private school educator at a predominantly white school with a predominantly white faculty, that it's been difficult for me at times to create a space for myself and also for my black female students and my black male students as well, um, when there are, you know, you can count on one hand how many of them there are in the classroom sometimes. And I'm thinking with regard to creating a space for ourselves, I'm always also thinking about my experience at an Ivy League institution and really thinking about how my education has been in these very white uh, privileged spaces. And I'm wondering um, if you could speak to a little bit of your experience in that way, like I know in teaching, to transgress, you talk about um, what you really loved about going to all black schools and how learning was, uh, you know, social justice for you when you were at these all black institutions or your all black schooling and grade school. And I'm thinking, I don't know if I'm barking up the wrong tree in teaching at these schools and, you know, talking to my students about deciding between perhaps a historically black college or going to Harvard. Because um, it can be psychologically damaging <laughs> going to these places that, um, you know, your very presence is offensive. And I'm wondering, is that the wrong message? I don't know. It, is it just so difficult well, to I create mean, a space for yourself in those places that we maybe no shouldn't go there? where we can go, uh, where we're not going to be subject to adversity, suffering. It may be different at an HBC, but it's there. Um, and so the question really is, again, what is our vision? What is our intentionality? 
how do you deal with where you're located? Um, how, do you, how, do you, how do you see your revolutionary self there in that white setting? I mean, one of the things I keep talking about is the whole question of white people changing and how we don't have enough images of white folks undergoing processes of decolonization. What, what does that look like? May, maybe your, your calling is to be there and to be part of teaching that to them as you also um, help black students decolonize. Only you can decide that. Thank you so much. <laughs> good afternoon, good evening to all of y'all. Um, I just really want to say quickly that I'm honored to share space with everybody on the panel, as well as the teachers and the healers in the audience as well. Um, so thank you all for being here. I had a question, oh, my name is Danielle Stevens. Hi, nice to meet y'all. Um, <laughs> I had a question, um, kind of just, it, it goes back to um, how you all were implicating Beyonce within this um, black feminist discourse. And I know Belle was at your talk yesterday and you said that you were not interested in talking about Beyonce within black feminism. Um, but this, I'm, I just sort of was wondering, how do we understand and acknowledge a historical trajectory of black women being subject to sexual commoditization and exoticization, but also create a liberatory sex positive framework for black women in ways that honor our sexual agency? I mean, I think that's the critical question. <laughs> um, what is that, what does that liberatory sexuality look like? I mean, let, let me theorize that it may very well be that celibacy is the face of that liberatory sexuality. <laughs> that I would rather not be sexual uh, than to be... <laughs> now that's making me uncomfortable. <laughs> I can't fit in that no, box, I'm, though. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be futuristic here. <laughs> that... Well, but what does it mean to be able to say, I'd rather not be sexual than to be sexual in any context where I am being mistreated, where I have doubt, where, I, where, where my feelings are not, um, where I am triggered as an abuse survivor or what have you. Um, I mean, I'm just posing um, what, are, what are our choices um, as we think about journeys to sexual freedom? What choices do we have? People don't ask me much. I guess I'm getting old. They used to ask me who I was having sex with and try to write it on walls and stuff. But I often identify, identify myself as queer past gay. And I came up with this with one of my white um, colleagues, lesbian colleagues, where we were saying that all of our lives we've experienced ourselves as queer, as not belonging as the essence of queer. I think of Tim Dean's work on being queer and queer not as being about who you're having sex with. That can be a dimension of it, but queer as being about um, the, the self that is at odds with everything around it and has to invent and create and find a place to speak and to thrive and to live. Um, and I think that that is what where, where we are going towards in trying to find that sexuality. And I think that it's so crucial that trans people are so at the forefront of that because that is where, uh, among trans people, that the imagination is called forth in, in the reconstructing and the re-envisioning of self and possibility. So that that, to me, is one of the positives of the, fo the, the sort of focus, because we know, you know, the New York Times does their piece on trans or whatever, that we all know that in some ways this too shall pass as all our kind of progressive things. Remember when black women writers were hot um, and how that passes. But while that's happening, I think we can, we can garner strength from the diversities of people's stories um, the, the divorce diversities of people's imagination. Thank Behind you. you. Uh, thanks so much, everybody, for being here, obviously. Uh, so uh, your segue was a great thing for my, like, thought or my question, because a lot of what you're talking about with, like, like spaces of the imaginary, uh, like, as queer and trans subjects, queer and trans subjects of color, as 
students of like queer theory and trans studies, uh, sort of recognizing how those spaces are, come so much from like like the work of like Sadie Hartman, like we taught Sadie Hartman, we read that with Audre Lorde and we read that along Fred Moten and then we, it's in the same classes are like queer theory and our trans studies texts. So like reading these subjects alongside each other. So that's like the basis for my question about uh, how we talk about sex and sex work um, and like, and how, how do we hold like, uh, like hypersexuality and the hyper and the damaging hypersexualization that comes from like the white cap like capitalist uh, white supremacist and it's also cis heteropatriarchal mach you know, machine alongside the subjects who have to do things like trade sex work, trade sex for survival, uh, whose alternative imaginary spaces are all about like hard femininity or like hyper femininity or high fem or like these other kinds of performativities that are so so okay. how do we like. I'm, I'm just I'm looking yeah. to see if we can reframe our conversation about sex work if we consider the subjects who like in, have to can't if who are we leaving behind well one of the best books that deals with this is your tongue on my theory um, and I think that it's a very useful exploration of varied and diverse sexualities um, because I mean you know we can't delineate everything at a talk um, but it is definitely clear that, I mean, we are all struggling to come up with different representations and different sex acts. I mean, I, I got to go home and think about how just mentioning celibacy uh, <laughs> troubled the waters. <laughs> is somebody up here wanting to say something? Well, I think, I think a lot of my work has been about trying to have a nuanced conversation specifically about sex work. Um, because it seems like the feminist ideals around it tend to only talk about the trafficking piece, which I think is very important. But I think there's also a, a segment of the population that's being left behind, meaning when, no, when they have no other choice but to, and which was my experience as a teenager. I had no other choice but to do sex work in order to get access to hormones, in order to, get the, the, um, to pay for shelter, to get food, and all of these kind of things that I think a lot of queer and trans young people are going through, but no one's paying attention to that population beyond HIV, AIDS, people who are giving them condoms, which is powerful. And so I think that when we're talking about, for me and my experience as a young trans woman of color, having come out of that and needing, and using that as an underground railroad of resources to get the stuff that I was not able to access in a system not built for me, how do we have those kind of nuanced conversations around sex work and don't shame and further stigmatize people who have to choose it in order to trade what they need for survival, right? And also the people who just choose it and like respecting their agency and not saying that they need to be saved or that they're oppressed because they're using their bodies in this way. And just really respecting people's body autonomy to say I can do whatever the hell I want with my body in whichever spaces I choose to do it in or share it with or not share it with someone as <laughs> Bell says. <laughs> you respect your celibacy. I'll get that camera out of my bedroom. <laughs> supposed to follow up that like come on I've got the your name my, um, my name is Alicia and um, so um, so a big experience that I've been having for the last couple of years as both a teacher and as recently an entrepreneur is um, finding myself in this space mic. where I feel like I'm um, tricking people into like talking to me about like more or thinking more radically um, specifically right now, I've just started with my sister this business where um, we're getting into like androgynous accessories and outerwear, but we're starting on the front of bow ties. And bow ties specifically seem to go over really well with like white southern evangelical men, um, which has been a really weird space because like, you know, I took a picture here tonight and I'm going to post that on the Instagram for our business, but then I feel like I'm like, I guess I'm just always in this space, and with my bosses when I was an art teacher, I um, worked with like sp a serious intensive special needs population, and it, there was always this dialogue where like, well, they can't handle complicated ideas. Um, and I was always trying to like, kind of lying to people a little bit to convince them to let me show movies like the Black Power mixtape and Real Engine. Um, so I wanted to, I was hoping that you guys could speak about your experiences, and if you've ever 
dealt with that and how you've dealt with like the experience of trying to lead people to newer, more like open, radical ideas, but also kind of feeling like you're tricking them into doing it. <laughs> I don't feel. <laughs> uh, well, you know, in a way, I feel that way about everything I do. You know, I'm making a film about Angela Davis or Shirley Chisholm, and most people come to it like, oof, don't want to see that. Black woman runs for president. Ugh, she loses. That's the story, right? But that's not the story. Like, we have to reclaim our narr narratives. So the way that I open my films, I'm letting you know that's not the story. And so I'm tricking people with music, with images, with, you know, all of that kind of stuff, and creating a narrative. The story about Angela Davis, she's, you know, the, the argument we have when we're on panels is, you know, I'll say this is your life, what does that feel like to see your life? She's like, no, that's not my life, that's your movie. I do not see my life as a political crime drama with a love story at the center. <laughs> <laughs> but that was the vehicle in which I used to trick people, to trick people into investing in it. <laughs> to I trick like people. this use of the word trick. But it's not trick. I, I think, you know what came to mind was negotiation. Yeah, okay, kind of better word. Constantly having to be in negotiation. And so, but I guess my point is, we can either let somebody tell us these stories are invaluable or this work is invaluable, or we find a way to navigate it like water. Find a way. And so maybe you're right. Trick is not such a good word, but it's negotiate and navigate. Because I want to make it. But also, it's the kind of like, it's the cool kid on the block, right? The reason everybody flocks to the cool kid is because the cool kid walks down the street going like, I'm the shit, you know? Like, and everybody's <laughs> like, ooh, I want to be like that person, you know? So if you basically come, or, or instead of, you know, this sort of negotiation, if it's, it's not up for negotiation, it's just like, here it is, and this is great, and I present it as great, and that's what I'm presenting, then you don't have to lead, because then people will follow you. Your name? Hi, so um, my name is Manny, and um, so I just sort of recently came to the realization that I identify as a trans woman, and I just recently started sort of um, starting my transition, and I feel like one of the things that I've struggled the most with has been sort of um, how do you deal with sort of, um, how do you like prove to yourself that you're like, woman and what does that mean and when you want to like break gender barriers um and you don't want to say yeah like i, I want to present myself as woman but it's not just about looking like a woman um and feeling really bad um about wanting to be pretty and the fact that all these things are like really internalized and um so i guess my question just is like even for like all of you how do you sort of come to a realization of like you know, like, this is what makes me, like, woman, and, yeah. I, well, congratulations, first of all. <laughs> and thank you for sharing yourself with us and choosing to be visible and vocal um, about something I think that we all struggle with, which is we've been talking about images and how do we get outside of the images of what people feed us, what we're fed through media, what we're fed through seeing people on the streets. Um, I think for me, the way that I changed it was through seeing womanhood as my own composite of many different images. And I can pull from Beyonce, I can pull from Claire Huxwell, but I can also pull from like, RuPaul, because that RuPaul fed me a lot <laughs> growing up, um, and pull from all these different kinds of images of what a woman, my woman, would look like, what I would look like in this space, imaginings of what Janie Crawford looked like in my own brain beyond just what Zora said on the page. And so all of these things kind of helped me, and I think it's using your imagination and also challenging, um, I guess, the constraints of what's visible to you now. I think that also, that also helped me a lot. I think there was an era in which I was not, quote unquote, successful with passing. And I think that was difficult to walk out of my house and be checked every single time I walk to say that you're not a woman. I deal with it on different levels now, which is because I choose to be vocal of saying that I'm a woman. And even I got a few tweets after saying that I'm part of this black female body. It's like, what is she doing up there? You know, and this is, and to realize that you're always good, as a trans woman, you're always going to have 
to deal with that. And that is part of the journey. I think women of color, period, all I have to deal about this idea of you're not really womanhood. Ain't I a woman? And so really just framing it around that, that just because you may get to the sense of how you know yourself to be, you're still going to be challenged by it. And we're all challenged by it. Hi, Belle. I don't know if you remember me. I met you a long time ago at the San Francisco Art Institute uh, when I was a student there. Um, Your name? Reginald. Reginald M. Lamar. Or M. L Most people know me as M. Lamar because I'm performing as that these days. Um, but Reginald, I mean, I was going by Reginald. We, we, uh, we'll talk later. But um, <laughs> my questions, I sort of have two questions. And, and I think it relates back to sort of 12 Years a Slave. I think, I think of 12 Years a Slave and Django and but The Butler and all these sort of movies in sort of a similar way. And the way that they seem to be made is in, in this very, like, authentic way. Like, we have to sort of get to some authentic truth about... Um, and, and a realism, right? A realism about black life. I mean, that, that is the, the narrative. I mean, so, I mean, so if you could speak to sort of like this question of like trying to represent in black culture, or black cultural production, um, images that, that don't have to be so rooted in the real or some narratives that are so sort of invested in realism. Okay, so that's the first question. And then I have this, I'm writing about my mother um, who was um, from Mobile, Alabama, as I am. and. Um, grew up in the 50s. And um, having one of the, one of the sort of main things is, is this thing of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, sort of intergenerational post-traumatic stress disorder, and how it sort of passed on, you know, uh, from my grandfather who was, you know, grew up in a sharecropping situation, and my grandmother who was a maid. I mean, like, these things that were sort of given uh, to my mother and then given to me and this kind of trauma. And I guess not wanting to only write about the trauma, but needing to tell the truth about how abusive she was and how, I mean, you all... All right. Um, you know, just tell, you know, uh, and how she was just so deeply wounded, right? I mean, it, because she witnessed so many horrifying things. I mean, so she was, this, so telling the truth about her woundedness, but I, I also think she's amazing, but I also haven't talked to her in 10 years. You know, so I mean, you know, I have this incredible, like, regard and respect for my mother, but then I, you know, we don't talk. So it's this, it, you know, very complicated thing. And so, yeah, so there's the, there are two questions, and I'll... You know, trauma produces complications. And those complications often stay with us to a life, for a lifetime, no matter how much healing work you, you've done. Um, but, but one of the, the joys of healing is that it allows you to separate out um, that which may have wounded or hurt you, but that which also may have been life restoring and life giving to you. And especially those of us, I think, from abusive, dysfunctional family contexts are constantly doing that work of memory, uh, but of trying to come to that point of the holistic memory, where you're not just remembering uh, the bad stuff. I mean, my sisters and I joke about dad a lot, the patriarchal terrorist, and um, I, um, I went through a period uh, where people kept telling me that dad wanted to talk to me. My dad is dead, and I, so I was calling my sisters, and I said, girl, you know, dad, dad that didn't say shit to me while I was alive, uh, I hear he's trying to talk to me. Um, but the interesting thing was me, you know, a lot of times we're watching ourselves. And I was watching my own negation of dad. And the interesting thing about, for me, about how I live my life, when enough people said to me, your dad is trying to reach you, I thought, well, I really maybe need to get in touch with somebody who can get me in touch with whatever dad is trying to say. Uh, and when I got in touch with a certain kind of spiritual healer who does a certain work around memory, a lot of it was dad wanting to, to express his sadness about how he dealt with me, um, wanting forgiveness and wanting me to go on and have um, the life that I had chosen. Um, but I wouldn't have been able to have that whether it's fictive or not, without opening myself to the parts of dad that were not awful, and that I'm able to remember my dad um, in, in the goodnesses of his um, actions as well as in the painfulness of his actions. And I see my brother is very closed off to remembering any kind of good action or positive action, and I think that that's very wounding for him. And and really tamp tamps down his own growth. Your name? Uh, hi, I'm Wallace. Um, I just wanted to ask you, I mean, there's so much discussion about media and images, and you know, part of this whole 
the one of the first questions was about SNL Saturday Night Live and the, the joke that was made there this past week. But um, there's also the show Scandal, which um, you know a lot of people watch, a lot of black people watch, and I watch it. I don't know why I watch it, <laughs> but I watch it. And, um, and so I'm curious about your interest or your understanding of what that show, I don't know if you've ever watched it, but. Not at all. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, this, this I haven't, but maybe other woman in Washington, she's. I know a, what it's about. You know. I've seen scenes from it, but. See, and, you know, it, it, it's produced by a black woman, and so. You your know, question in that we're kind of running out of time. Okay. Um, I anyway, you know, I, I just wondered if you had a critique or an interest in kind of understanding what the connection is between you know that show and its audience, and this whole issue of black women's bodies and desire. Well, you know, I think television is a bit like celibacy. We need less of it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because so, I, I don't think we will ever know how much pain that comes into our lives as people of color from those images, and especially the lives of children who are, who are kind of consuming images in a very different way because they don't have the blockers that we can have as adults. Um, because we don't have our team, our magnificent, wonderful team of psychoanalysis um, psychoanalysts looking at the damage that is being done to us constantly by people, by images, um, and that wound and assault. Um, so, f like, I don't watch a lot of um, television. I've talked in other talks about, you know, teaching my class and hearing myself singing this little song um, that I didn't know why I knew it. Um, and it was my first experience of realizing that television had imprinted something in my brain that I didn't know how it got there. And that was the end of me not being critically vigilant about the images that I consume. So that I, I think one thing I want to say is that will produce a transformation is when we as people of color are more critically vigilant about the images we consume. Um, and not just accepting, um, oh, I like that, or it was fun, because, you know, a lot of stuff that is toxic is fun. Uh, and so having to make a choice is very different. Your name? Hi, um, my name is Joy, and this is Kat. This is a two-for-one. Um, we're <laughs> grad students here at the New School, and we focus on um, spatial urban issues, so more like architecture and urban design. And we're getting a lot of resistance in the fact that we we can't talk about difference and inequality unless we're only talking about economic inequality. It's like that's the box that we're allowed to talk about it within the, um, the new school, not all programs, but in our program it feels like we're in a box. And I wanted to know if you had any, um, well, I wanted to know if you had any examples or any ways that we can fight for our right to difference beyond just talking about economics, because it feels like as a black scholar, I'm only allowed to talk about um, history, I'm allowed to talk about conflict, I'm not allowed to talk about moving forward and models and tools of, for how we can um, be intercultural in the future, but I can only talk about it within the economic framework. Because we are running out of time, we'll hear all of these questions and have people respond to the parts of them that they feel called to. Your name? Hi, my name is Danae. Um, I'm a graduate student at Fordham University, um, the Graduate School of Social Service. Um, studying to be a researcher, and, and with that particular field in that area, you know, there's not a lot of people of color, uh, you know, doing research in the social sciences and stuff like that. And originally, I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana. I'm from the South, and coming up here, it's like big. It's real different, you know. They still burn crosses down there and everything else. And so, a lot of my friends up here tell me, you know, that that I'm oppressed and things like that. And I keep telling them, you know, I'm like, don't oppress me, because I, I based on what I know, I don't feel oppressed. So. And, and especially in school and different things, I use to my advantage kind of being the quote unquote token black person to get where I need to be to advance, you know, in my career and things of that nature. But I just wanted to know, coming from, I want to get the opinion from other black scholars, what, like, am I, like, am I really, am I compromising myself by doing that? Because sometimes I feel like 
they're using me as a sort of gatekeeper because I'm doing research with like formerly incarcerated individuals, LGBT mental health and things of that nature. And so sometimes I feel like I'm the access to get into these populations that are kind of hard to reach. But I'm just, I'm wondering, so am I, do I feel, yeah, I don't know, like, am I supposed to feel oppressed? You know, <laughs> like, I don't know, <laughs> like, I don't know. <laughs> Can you hand the mic? Thank yeah. you. Your name? My name is Sandy. Um, I'm actually here for my daughter. She's a big fan of yours. My question is this. I come from uh, a line of plus size women. And my daughter is also plus size. And I've always taught her you're beautiful no matter what you look like. Everybody can't be a size two. Be the best you that you can be. Unfortunately, I've gone through the whole eating disorder. She's cutting, she's burning, she's binging, she's purging, she's doing all this stuff. We got her into treatment, we thought she was okay. Apparently not, and I've done uh, the group therapy, the family therapy, I've done all that. So I'm wondering, you know, as a mom, and as a mother to a black female, what else can I do? What else can I say? We've done therapy, we've done treatment. I see that she's unhappy. I see she has a lot of issues. I'm doing the best I can, but I'm angry now because I don't know what else to do. Hmm. <laughs> I think the most radical action that you are taking is that you are there for her. Um, and to never stop being there for her, no matter the different forms her crisis may take. Because I think that that sense that someone is there for you and that is never gonna let you go uh, can be in and of itself at certain points uh, a healing um, force in your life. I'm sorry, Shala, I didn't see that you were trying to say something. No, go no, ahead. no, no, no. My daughter's four, and so what I'm thinking about is, oh my gosh, oh, I mean, I just have an emotional response. I, 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 don't, I don't know what to say, but what you said is so beautiful. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to use it <laughs> because I don't know. Kids are kids. The, I mean, I feel like she's internalized so much self hatred. So how do you help her see herself um, truly and her beauty? Well, I mean, one of the things you're letting us know is you're not uh, the person for her right now in terms right, of right. being being that mirror into which she looks. And I, I think that find her finding, I mean, and you're maybe talking with her about who does speak to you, who does address your sense of what it is you're going through. Because I love it when B B Buddhist teacher Pima Chodron says, start with people where they are, not where you want them to be not with what you think they should be, but right where they are. Um, and I think that goes to your question about, um, are you oppressed, are you, you know, I, I think Shala said it so well earlier that you cannot have your mind on what other people are trying to do or other people's agenda. Your strength comes from knowing your own agenda and following it with your intentionalities not in thinking about, oh, are my colleagues uh, trying to use me? What, what are they trying to do? Or am I a traitor? Or th those kind of questions just are, are nowhere questions. And it's much more exciting to think about what am I doing? And I think this goes to the, the young women who are graduate students who are trying to navigate that space is just to be claiming as much space as you can claim within that discipline within your classes um, because I think it is there that your strength lies in the continual celebration of your passion for space, um, for thinking critically about space. We have to be able to follow those passions. Um, I feel like 
for me, that was one of the saving things as an abuse survivor of my life was to be in touch with what are my dreams, what are my passions, um, and what little bit can I do every day of my life to bring myself closer. And you know, I always gotta do a shout out for therapy because I really believe that if we get good therapy, uh, it can help us get on a healing path. And, and you can have a therapeutic friend. You don't have to be going to, to pay or see somebody. You can have someone with whom you can have meaningful restorative conversation with. We want to end this meaningful conversation with a shout out of thanks to Stephanie Browner um, and to Heather who did so much of the, the footwork and to these wonderful women, uh, my sisters up here, um, may we dance in the circle of freedom always and the hope that all of you will join us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.